Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by MarketFi. I'm your co-host, Joel Alconin, along with Brianna Valeski, and we have Kevin McPartland on the line. He's a principal of market structure and technology at Greenwich Associates. Kevin, how you doing this morning? Great, thank you. How are you guys? We're doing good. A little bit chilly here in Michigan, but we've seen to avoided the big snowstorms. Uh, I want to talk about an issue here that is, you know, is going on um, overseas. And it, you know, if it gets approved overseas and it comes over here, it could be a big problem the financial for the financial markets. And that's the financial transaction uh, tax that's being proposed in France and Austria. Can we get your thoughts on that? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I, so I think what I think the 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 goals that the regulators have in mind here, right, are to slow things down a little bit, to to uh, make sure that the transactions are maybe a little bit more thought through, at least in their view. Um, so maybe the the trading is, we get back to maybe bigger size trades, um, you know, slightly less frequent. Um, but but you know, all that said, I mean, it, it, if we look at history and some other places where this has been attempted, you know, generally it's a big hit on on market volumes, and it's going to be really really. Uh, I think it's going to be a really tough go for everyone involved, especially in markets where, you know, for the for the dealer community where spreads are already so tight, and and you know, especially since 2008, it's been particularly hard um, to make money in a variety of uh, areas, everything from equities to to, to corporate bonds to government bonds, um, you know, where these the dealers are just sort of pulling out of these markets and really hurting liquidity. Um, um, it's uh, this. This is only going to add insult to injury, right? If it's just sort of a further cut out of uh, out of the small profits they're already trying to take to stay in the business and provide liquidity to investors. Yeah, that's certainly. Uh, we don't want to see anything more that would hurt liquidity. So let's say they pull it off over there in France and Austria. I mean, is there any chance that this could be imposed on the U.S. markets? Uh, yeah, I mean, we never say never anymore, right? We've seen some uh, some interesting things happen over the last several years that maybe we wouldn't have thought would have happened ten years ago. But but no, I, I think if if I if, if I had a place to bet, I would say it's pretty unlikely here. I think the the political headwinds, I think the lobbying that would go on, um, and and quite frankly, the, the the you know the the other distractions that the U.S. regulators have right now. Uh, I, this would just be sort of years and years down the road. I, I, I don't see how it really benefits anybody, um, and I think most in the most in the U.S. markets would would have that view. Um, and we've seen, you know, if you have a group, you know, sometimes you'll have maybe investors want one thing and the dealers want another, or exchanges want one thing and the dealers want another. Uh, I think we would have a case here where almost everybody would be aligned, maybe outside of the regulators. And when that's the case, it's going to be pretty hard to, to get anything to to move through. Uh, do you think that, uh, you know, if they, I mean, first of all, I mean, trying to take, oh, you know, uh, eliminate speculation with the chance of hurting liquidity, to me, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. Um, do you think that, you know, if they went forward with this, that there might be exemption for market makers? Because, I, I mean, we they're, they're dropping by the wayside anyways. Do you think there may be some um, exemption for this? Yeah, makers. I mean, the, you know, but so this is where I mean, we went through this with the derivatives reform, right? Where there is sort of we they put a, a pretty sort of hardcore rule in place, and then by the time we're done with it, you know, we have to carve out you know a variety of areas to make the rule realistic. At which point, then was it really worth it in the first place, and did we really get, or did the regulators really get what they thought they would get? Um, I think this might be be a case there. I mean, yeah, they would have to make some carve outs to let the market function, but in some ways, at least in my head, if if you're starting to have to make exemptions to rules, then maybe you should rethink the rule. Uh, you should rethink the rule in the first place. I mean, I, global regulators have done enough to hurt liquidity, you know, over the last six years, and I, and I appreciate the rationale, right? We're trying to, you know, reduce systemic risk is the is the sort of big pie in the sky goal here. Um, but you know, to some extent, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure we're we're chasing problems that really are problems in a, in a lot of these cases. So it would probably just end up hurting the little guy, you know, who ends up paying at the end for the end, and the little guy's already afraid of the market. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think you know, you and I think have talked about this before, right? When we go back to the to the sort of the old high frequency trading argument and 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 the you know how fast uh, the equities markets move and is it good or bad. You know, I still go back to that if I'm paying a couple of bucks a trade, which is down dramatically from where it was 20 years ago, ultimately that's good for the end investor. Any extra penny or two they're paying per trade because 
because uh, you know a professional's in there and and you know picking them off uh, is is nothing compared to what they've saved because of the technology and the innovation that the market has seen. So this feels like the same. I mean, it would certainly get passed on down. Um, you know, the, the the big brokers in the space would they pick up the charge and they would pass it down. They wouldn't eat it. Uh, if they ate it, they wouldn't be in business. So it's yeah, I just don't see how this is good for anybody. Let's go into the recent volatility in the market. And uh, can we get your thoughts on um, algorithmic traders and, you know, the momentum traders? I mean, are they the culprits here in the volatility? So it's interesting, right? So we think of it's hard to first we have to d- define if we think volatility is a good or a bad thing for the markets. Um, I mean, all of the research and writing we've done over the last six months. We keep talking about how volatility has been so low and we desperately want it back um, so everybody can start making some money again. Um, so, okay, so then the, the technology question here, uh, momentum traders, I mean, this almost takes us back to the flash crash argument. Um, you know, does technology sort of exacerbate these situations? Yeah, I mean, it makes the, you know, if you're going to have a crash, you're going to have a crash. Technology certainly helps it move move faster than it did, you know, 30 years ago, but then the recovery is, is, you know, sort of happens equally as quickly, you know, with technology in place. Um, so, you know, yeah, sure. If we dig down to these charts that we all see posted up online of microsecond moves, then, then things look crazy. But, you know, over the long haul, uh, you know, fundamentals to some extent always still seem to come back in there. So, um, but, but yeah, so uh, I think volatility now is more of a macro sort of economic issue than it is anything to do with the market structure. Okay. And, uh, you know, just going on to, you know, just with the high frequency trading and we, Dennis and I have talked about this and maybe even with you, it's that, you know, they'll be in there in certain periods of the market when there's liquidity to lean on. They have no affirmative obligations when the market's, you know, on the open or at certain times during the day. Is there anything, you know, is there anything that, you know, could be done to, you know, get more, you know, to change the rules just a little bit if they're going to be, you know, providing liquidity, at least, you know, do it more consistently? Yeah, no, that I think would be a good thing, right? Is to is to make some requirements. Now, I, I would I would uh, take it in the direction of rather than saying you know you must register or or you must pay these fees to be able to come in these in these exchanges and make markets. I prefer we go along the lines of incentivizing it, right? If you want if you want uh, a trading firm to commit to being there when things are going bad and they need to catch the falling knife, you need to ensure that they're incentivized enough during good times. Uh, to, so that they will uh, commit to being there during bad times. Uh, exactly what that structure is, um, you know, it's, up, it's certainly up for debate. There are plenty of options. But, um, yeah, if we could put incentives in place to ensure liquidity providers stick around in good times and in bad, um, I don't see how that could be a bad thing for the market as a whole. Uh, along these lines, how are things going on the tick size pilot, and uh, are we going to see it implemented this year? Um, no, I mean, I think it's going to take a while. These things certainly take time. Um, you know, we need to get the data back and, and, and give everybody time to sort of dig through it and see what happens. The, the, the theory is, is, is a good one, um, but, I, I, again, I like the way that they're, they're going about it. It's a thought, thoughtful approach. Let's try it. Let's see what happens. Let's let everybody analyze the results and see if we feel like we're really getting, um, you know, the liquidity improvements that we're hoping for here. It's hard to know, right? It's, it, you know, it, it goes back to why why is there low liquidity in some of these names? Is it because nobody's interested in trading them anyway, uh, or is it because there there is uh, nobody willing to make markets, or maybe one leads to the other? Um, but hopefully, we'll find out. This is a pretty interesting market structure experiment that, you know, if it is successful. You could certainly see that approach implemented um, in other parts of the equities market and potentially even in other, um, you know, other sort of derivatives and over-the-counter markets as well. Uh, what about the trade-at rule in the tick, si- uh, tick size uh, pilot? What are your thoughts on that? And at first, you know, please explain the trade-at rule and then your thoughts on it. Yeah, I mean, so this, goes, this almost takes us to the grand bargain conversation um, you know, the trade out rule really will incentivize, you know, in, in, in short, will incentivize folks to do more trading um, on the for registered exchanges as opposed to in some of the dark pools. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of nuance here, of course, to what's good and what's bad. I mean, I think what ICE is proposing um, is not, uh, you know, is, is a pretty is a pretty reasonable solution. I think they're trying to, um, you know, keep everybody happy here. It's certainly not good for um, some of the bank owned pools. 
Um, but I think it could ultimately be a positive for some of the more independent guys, the liquid nets and bids of the world, um, as maybe the, the sort of the, the, the ATS list is shortened and, um, and sort of those independent firms, um, you know, with models that are arguably, uh, or at least in my opinion, you know, the, the models that, you know, were put in place, this is why dark pools were invented, right? It's to help folks do bigger size trades with less market impact than, you know, they'll ultimately um, be successful. Um, but again, I mean, it's going to, we've got a couple of years to go before we really see any changes here. These are big, big changes to the market. Um, I think the market needs some changes. Uh, it would be nice if we could simplify things a little bit. And one way to simplify things would be to have less places to execute. And this could certainly uh, take us in that direction. And that's kind of taking it into my next question, just your overall thoughts on market structure. If you had a, a wish list, uh, what would be the top three things you would change in market structure or address? Yeah, so in equities, I mean, it's well. I'll take, I'm going to give you a cop out answer, right? It's simplify, <laughs> simplify, simplify. Right? If 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 I if I had my way, um, we would shut the markets down for two weeks and put everybody in a room and lock the door and and not let them out until they agree on a new way forward. You know, we're working off of legislation that was written a hundred years ago before you know before we had technology. Uh, at all, right? Before we had computers and and we were talking in milliseconds, um, it's it's just the market is so different than it was um, even 20 years ago, let alone 100. Um, that you know we're being forced to adopt you know um, changes and band aids to old rules to make the market continue to function um, in a way that you know makes it effective and allows you know firms to raise you know corporations to sort of raise cash, which is really the original intention. Um, so anything that can be done to simplify uh, the structure is good. Now that said, we, we I think the other thing that we need to keep in mind, you know, the, since the, the crisis, there's certainly been a target on the on the dealer community, um, you know, which in some cases, okay, maybe you know is fair, but in, I think in, in the rest, in other cases, it's not. Um, we need to remember that we need. You know, we need the brokers in the market to help, uh, you know, grease the skids and, and, and keep trade and keep flow going. Um, so if you make it, you know, so impossible to make money in the markets, they're, they're not going to have any reason to be there. And if they're not there, you know, then again, like we just talked about a few minutes ago, that's that's not good for the end investor, right? That only raises costs and limits liquidity, and we don't want that to happen. So, so I guess to sum that up, I mean, we want we want we want simpler markets. I think we. We could we could do be better off with fewer venues, uh, but we want the incentives to stay in place to keep the brokers, um, you know, in the market and able to make enough money that they feel like it's worth uh, providing that service to uh, to the to the industry. Okay, we're on the line with Kevin McPartland. He's principal of Market Structure and Technology at Greenwich Associates. Kevin, before I let you go, I I got a tough question for you. Are you, are you ready for it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Try me. Okay. All right. I'll give you a second to answer. All right. You got deep expertise in OTC derivative markets, right? And what took us down during the financial crisis in 2008, 2009 were, you know, the mortgages, the jumbo packages, mortgage loans, and the derivative markets. Are you seeing anything out there in the derivatives markets? I know the government's tried to shut it down a little bit. That is, is any cause for concern? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of 2008 does go back to mortgages, and wherever you point the source of that is, you know, again, that's a we'll save that for another show because that's a long conversation. Um, I do start to, I, I am starting to feel a little concerned as you see um, underwriting standards seem to be dropping again. Um, you know, I was reading some some research a few days ago that talked about how you know. Subprime mortgages are back. We just don't call them subprime anymore. We call them non-prime, so they don't seem so scary. Um, so, you know, memories are very, very short. Um, so, you know, here's to hoping that the new regulations in place will stop, you know, uh, you know, scary, complex uh, structured derivatives from being rated AAA when they're not. Um, but, you know, it, it it does feel a little bit like we're, you know, we're, we're sort of loosening again, which certainly helps the economy to get moving. Um, but it, it makes me wary of where we're going to be 10 years from now, uh, particularly with rates having been so low and, and money so cheap for so long that, that yeah, it, it makes me worry what, what, what the results are going to be 10 years from now. So, so we'll, we'll see. I mean, thankfully the markets are going in the right direction and, and, and 
uh, everything seems to be picking back up. And, you know, we talked about volatility, which ultimately is good for the financial markets, at least. Right. Um, okay. Let's, let, let's, let's hope I'm wrong and the mortgage market is, uh, is in a better place than it was uh, 10 years ago. All right. Great answer to a tough question. Kevin McPartland, Principal of Market Structure and Technology at Greenwich Associates. Kevin, it's always great having you on. I know Dennis loves to be on with you, too, but uh, we're going to get you right back on the schedule. Thanks a lot. Have a great day and a great weekend. Thank you. You guys, too. Stay warm.